I'll be uh, I'll be so, here for the first half hour. Oh, awesome. So this is the reconstituted or at least rescheduled NeoBooks call. Uh, now, immediately after the free jury's brain call, so we have some intermingling in the estuary of time here. Uh, Jose, you are muted, so we're not hearing you. There so we, we now have free brainers. Is that what you're saying? Yeah, yeah, exactly. It's like free state of brain. And here's Rick. Rick, I hope the shifting of our time didn't throw you too much. I, I got an email that said Rick is in your Zoom room this morning at the old time of our calls. And I'm like, ah, OK. But good to see you here. Um, we were going to pick up on something, Jose, from last Monday. And Jack, I'm forgetting what where we were. Um, Mark Antoine was here, uh, not Jack's last last week. I think that's right. Mm -hmm. Exactly, Jack's couldn't make it last week. That's and, right. And the reason and, for the shift, well, I appreciate it too, by the way. Yeah, well, you're most we, welcome. Yes, nice. yes. <laughs> yeah, nice to talk to you while it's light outside. <laughs> <laughs> that's your natural light on my face here today. <laughs> Uh, to be very honest, I've just gotten off three calls back to back. So oh. I don't know that my mind is clear enough to, uh, if you recall, that was one of the issues about changing the, the thing. So understood. Uh, so I, I can't say that I've uh, had enough time to swing over to this conversation. Do you want to take a moment and do a ritual brain purge of some sort and then come back in or? Yeah, that might be a good idea. Just take a breath, take a walk, whatever you'd like. You know, whatever, I'll be back. Whatever you need to to be able to, to jump in comfortably. Thanks, Rick. Yeah, I, I, it's funny because um, I think one of the challenges, because just exactly for what Jose just said, there are so many threads, and it's it's sort of like a it's a mush, you know. And it's difficult to pull out the thread from something that happened a week ago. Oh, my God. The yes. metaphors and the physical thing that Wendy was showing in the last hour, you just spoke out loud. That, oh, well, I'm... Okay. Check this out. Check this out. That's a jar of threads that she, okay. used, that she used for a meeting. Oh, okay. Perfect. Well, exactly. I use that metaphor quite frequently. So, obviously, we're metaphorically in tuned on some of them anyway. Yep. Uh, <clears throat> but, you know, it's funny because I can never make the Thursday one. Um, and I'm interested in governance. So actually, I started watching it. And as I was watching it, I was writing comments in. And actually, fact, I think this is something from a learning perspective. We don't do a very good job of when we put these resources. Does anybody ever look at them? Uh, some, people, I mean, some people do. I know, but I know they do, but, but I'm not, just saying. But not a lot. That, not exactly. It's minuscule. And uh, what, so what I did, I just. Amount, I just yeah. I just started watching uh, the last one, or the one that was on governance, and uh, I started writing comments in. And I think, you know, if if that were available and after the session and it's posted, you go and just write a few notes or if you watch it again or something so that you can go back and quickly look at it to sort of reconnect to those things. Now, the reason why I say this is because that's what I do in clinical practice all the time. I can't remember everybody, you know, but if I get three or four facts, poof. You know, it opens the door and it helps to launch the dialogue more effectively. So, um, I'm gonna I'm gonna watch the whole one of that one and write comments on, uh, and see whether it gets any reactions. And all this communication that happens for me on email, I find very disoriented because I'm not full time on your channel, um, and so I, I pop in to see. Well, I wonder what's going on. You know, and so I think. Uh, we, we still have to learn how to use these different modalities and create uh, metaphorical threads. So, w Wendy, if that resonates with you, I'm glad that it does. By the way, we, our last three or four OGM Thursday calls have been about envisioning a new reality, and they've had sort of 21, uh, 7, uh, 6, and 3 views, so not a lot of views. Yeah, but it's not just the views. It's it's the quality of the reflection, mm. you know. 
Uh, and, you know, people put these inane comments on and you think, what the, what, okay, you liked it. So, you know, or, you, you know, the odd thing. So I, I think to do it, I mean, to me, this is part of the transformational learning experience. If we're going to actually delve into complexity more effectively, we have to create better connections between the dots of our experiences in ways that actually enables us to move the needle a little. I don't think we're moving the needle in the right direction, but that's a, mm. that's a sidebar conversation. The, no, no, I think it's it's totally relevant. Sorry, Wendy, can I quickly? The I've always been astonished at the notion of liking. Uh, it was more in post uh, threaded conversations, but it's like usually an, uh, a post contains more than one idea. Which one did you like, or do you approve of the reflection, or if something says something is terrible? Uh, <laughs> which part are you are you approving the terrible thing or you know the fact that it's terrible it's it's ridiculous the um and that's why we need to be able to annotate interpret and say i think this segment is saying this and this is the part i agree with and this is the part i don't agree with and and and, and the ability to break things down and interpret which is <clears throat> what we're talking about i think in Knowledge objects, uh, neo books is about what is the granularity, and the reality is granularity is fractal, and and being able to decompose any knowledge objects into subcomponents, you have to, even if uh, there's never going to be any atom, right? There's never going to be a least uh, knowledge, undividable, un, um, undivisible knowledge object because everything is about it's links to everything else. So you have to accept that a knowledge object is going to be containing a lot of them. And that's how it is. And if you want to comment and like, you have to be able to break it down. Over. Um, Wendy, please. Uh, yeah. And so um, let me think. The quality of the reflection. So the first thought was, um, for my many sins, I got a gig once. Um, analyzing the content of 40 um, presentations in a conference about water in Australia. It's called Oz Water. And it was right at the very beginning of the COVID um, era. So I, um, I had the full transcripts of those. And what turned up across 40 of the presenters was really fascinating because we curated them because we had to do some curation into some groups, um, what the conference convener liked and then um, there were some topics. So that was really interesting. And one of my big frustrations about conferences is that there's, there isn't actually that much curation afterwards, not formally, and there's not curation between them either. <laughs> so it's it's whatever the sponsors want. And um, it was a really interesting piece of work and it's turned up a couple of long-term relationships. But there was never, we presented to the people who, um, who were convening the conference, the board of Oswater, um, the conference itself. And we also put in the two, at least one or two years worth of this is what I want in the next conference. So there wasn't a match of those two things. Have we delivered what people asked? Um, and then the third sort of thought about the granularity piece. Um, oh, it's turning up again with the GLAM um, conference that I've just been to, the one around... Um, galleries, libraries, and museums is that um, now knowledge objects, they're all knowledge objects, Marc Antoine. <laughs> now, a picture in a museum is a knowledge object with a whole history and, you know, such around it. So that these guys were talking, you know, the millions and millions and millions of knowledge objects, all of which needed to be reproduced to keep them ticking over and then being able to relate to one another. So there was the whole element of how did they relate in the past, which is a transclusion problem partly that could never be solved, by the way. And then there's the future storytelling that everyone wanted to be able to achieve by digitising these really large collections from across the whole world, you know, Smithsonian and British Library. And then there was the stories told at the place which weren't connected or couldn't really be connected except for through one person's view and what they said. So there was so much that went on. 
I'll shut up now. And it was a good conference, Jax. I'm sorry you couldn't be there. <laughs> I love that. Uh, Rick, please. Yeah, I'd like to weave a, a, a thread from the two previous uh, conversations from uh, Antoine to you, Wendy. Um, you know, the, 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 the thing that about reviewing something is that you can get down to the granularity. And I think where the greatest learning is where you disagree. I mean, just saying you like, you say the same. What is, what's, what's the game there? Oh, I've got an affirmation. Somebody thinks like me. Oh, isn't that great? You know, uh, whereas we, we tend to avoid the differences because they're, they can be uh, conflictual and whatever. Um, and I don't think we're very good at disagreeing. And we have to learn how to be, we need to learn how to be um, more disagreeable in a healthy way. Mm -hmm. um, and the same thing what you said about the conference. I couldn't go with you more. Those conferences, I mean, they're just, you know, they're showmen, they're spectacles, and they don't have any threads. They don't have any continuity. There, there is a little co-design in it. There isn't a, an unconference format where that is curated so that it's constantly uh, evolving. It's, it's an evolving knowledge base, you know. I mean, you could use the Neo book metaphor that could be, somehow, you know, impregnated into that sort of way of learning. But our learning systems are so inadequate. And just to say, I only got in about 10 minutes into that. Uh, Jose, you're a little late to the party, but I understand. We were talking about using the videos and re reviewing them, putting our comments on there, so that when we come back to an event, we have to think, what the, what the hell did we talk about last week? Uh, and we can quickly connect to something that, you know, might resonate that you may want to continue a conversation with. So um, I did put a couple of comments and actually I had I had two disagreements right at the very beginning. Uh, not disagreements, but discernments. And that is I, I have a, a reservation, I, I will say, about uh, backcasting on dealing with wicked problems. The, to me, it's it's it's. It's there's so many problems with it. That's number one. There's, there's some advantages to it, but from my lens, the disadvantages outweigh the advantages. Now that would be an interesting conversation to have to tease out why people feel strongly about this and others don't. And the other was uh, something about what Jose you said at, at four minutes thirty seconds about problem solving and whether people can do it collectively or separately. And I, I, I put a third perspective in there about um, how people can co-create. It's not a question of a group coming up with a, an average solution versus um, a people coming up with their own individual solutions. To me, that's sort of a reductionist framework because the solutions aren't known. You don't know how good your solution is with a wicked problem. You'll never know because... The, Somebody could have come up with a better one, but it was never tested because that 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 wasn't tested. So to me, that speaks to the emergent challenges of trying to solve wicked problems, which backcasting, I don't think, is a very good framework for doing it. Now, you can disagree with everything I've just said, but it speaks to what Antoine was talking, Mark Antoine was talking about. The granularity is lost. Um, Jax, do you mind my hand accidentally went down? I just wanted to... Uh, you know, you go. That's okay. I'll, I'll, jump in. I'll yeah. uh, thanks. Um, I wanted to go back uh, to just a moment ago and say that there's a big difference between events or conferences you go to that are mostly commercial and held kind of as one-offs and uh, conferences that are punctuation for a living community. So like the IETF, when they meet in person, they've been working together all year. Most internet oriented or software orient, open software oriented working groups are exactly that. They're meeting in order to actually socialize, pass a few things, but they've been in conversation the whole time. And the conversation and the records and their mode of sharing records and having conversations, whether it's on a mailing list plus an FTP server or whatever, is where their documents are and how they see the world ongoing. At any, at any moment in time, you could come take a snapshot of kind of where they are or what they're up to and that would work fine. And I wish I wish all events were like that. Um, that that the, the the event and the problem is that there's hardly any commercial producer of events that wants to, never mind has the budget, to maintain the community ongoing between events. That's that doesn't fit nicely with, you know, the we're going to have a conference and get people to pay a lot of money for it and then on to the next. 
So, so we don't have a memory. So this cripples our ability to, to think together. Mm -hmm. uh, thanks. Jax, then, then Marc Antoine. Okay. And one probably comes well after, um, well after that, because I think there's a, well, so we always, there's always so many pieces to this, but some of what we're talking about here is time and quality and, um, thinking about Rick's experience going back and watching these is the power of reflection and, and sitting within time and having a quality interaction with the information, which is what you get when you go back and you watch something and you know what time things happen and you follow the conversation and you can do it outside of the space. So it's quite a quality experience. And to do that, you know, you need to have the time to do that. And when we start talking about conferences, you know, people have been working solidly and they, then they fly in and fly out often because it's such a compressed period of time to have an intense um, experience. So the first thing I think is around that quality of, of time, just an observation more than a comment. The bit that I want to add, and um, I'm probably going to drive people a bit nuts with the whole cybernetic thing because, you know, I've, I've been, for those who don't know, I've been accepted into a program next year. Yes, I'm cybernetic. So uh, I am not an expert at it by any means. I've just um, have been, and um, Pete's heard me say this a few times, I've been in living systems obsession for a while now. And the thing that I keep going back to in my understanding of that is around that li living systems thing around the quality of the um, system, or the output of the systems depend on the quality of the relationships and the flow of information. Now, I'm sure that can be critiqued and I'll probably get lots of opportunities to critique it as time goes on. But if we're looking at our neo books as a, a system of transfer of, of, um, of identification and constructing and transmitting of a knowledge object, Wendy, just to pick up on that term, and the way that we see that knowledge object is that it's not fixed in time as a book might be with print on the page, but it changes and 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 in its form. And yeah, Marc Antoine, I think that's what you're saying is especially as more context comes around and people start putting it together, it goes out and in and changes its form. So if 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 what we're doing is building those trying to build those objects and then passing them along, then it's a and that's what we're that's the system of this, you know, when it gets up and we, you know, we've got thousands and millions of people who are getting their building their knowledge books of nuggets, they're transmitting those ideas. So if that's what's happening within the system that we're trying to create here, or that we are have created, or Jerry, you've definitely, you know, like, this is a system, we do it every week, we come back to it, we have a bit more of a discussion, we have a go at it, we move it around a little bit. And then we, you know, pick it up again the next week. So what we've got here on this screen is um, ten. How many? How many? We've got eight people. No, seven people. I can't count. I'm like an I'm like an LLM who can't count. We've got seven people who are um, in relationship with each other in for an hour, which is oh, actually is an hour and a half, which is a, a large slab of time that we're having an in depth conversation. That's actually quite good relationship building. And then the information flow is the bit I think that we're looking at in terms of what gets put up on the um, online, how much it gets back out there into something else, how much happens between us over that period of time and over a long period of time with those nuggets. And I think what's happening is, uh, or what could happen with this is that as we transfer those nuggets at the moment, we, our system is not strong enough to keep our these things together as they go through. So they start to kind of um, come apart a little bit and then we get together and we pull them back together again and then they come apart again. So that's our system at the moment. The flow of information is the information's there, but it's not going very far. If you're saying there's 13 people who are looking at it and viewing it and they're not able to, in, they're not interacting with it because they don't have the quality of the insight that we have through this, they could have, but they don't have that ability to come and actually be part of this. So that so it's just that it's forming, I think. Um, so there, there's, a, there's my early take of a systems view of what we're doing and, and um, trying to understand it from that perspective. And I think we've got all the elements there and it's just around how we um, keep going with that as, as time goes on um, and to keep those knowledge nuggets moving along and growing and changing which is a, a noble 
noble uh, pursuit, I believe. Thanks, Jax. Um, Monsieur Parent? Just, uh, I wanted to react a bit not so quickly to something Rick said, which on the one hand, I totally agree, disagreements are more interesting than agreements. Uh, on the other hand, agreements are really interesting too. Of course, part of it is because we're social animals and we form cliques and we want to know who's with us. Yes, that's an emotional aspect. It's really important because the community doesn't exist unless there's a feeling that, you know, we're a community and we agree on some things, otherwise what's the point? So, so don't devalue agreement. But there's a other point I want to make. It's that you will know the value of a disagreement by comparing it to the agreements also. Uh, one group I'm talking with, a uh, group of very smart uh, scientists uh, in Germany, uh, well, entrepreneurs really, and they've, they've done a little algorithm on hacker news type things where you have agreement and disagreement on each post. And they use that to find which post gets people to get closer to the group, the maximum group knowledge. Like basically, you can say people who have commented on all the posts have understood, have absorbed the most information. So what's their average opinion? And what is the average opinion of people who have not read a lot or at least not ostensibly read a lot because they haven't voted on a lot? And if they have commented in a few posts, it's like this is a presumed and for uninformed opinion. And which reading which one sub post gets them closest to the presumed informed opinion. Uh, and this here's a reference if you're interested. You can only do those calculations if you have both agreement and disagreement. Uh, it allows to direct the conversation wonderfully to what is the crux of the matter uh, just <laughs> but i agree otherwise the really we do need to be, to get better at handling disagreement over please wendy i was part of a startup called mosaics in canberra that was aiming to inf revolutionize the education system by creating a system where um, it measured the, the relationship. So everybody vetted, and I'm, I think it was not quite designed the right way, but the idea is that everyone was exposed to um, something that was a, something you learn from. And then you, although everybody commented on that um, that piece of work, but they, I think you could do it in a way that it was obvious, um, shared and not shared, and then, thumbs up and thumbs down and then did the the shape of the whole exchange around that knowledge object and um it fell over because the guy concerned um wasn't handling his research and development funds properly so he had to sort of go dark and close it down um but it was much the same idea Marc Antoine there was something there about agreement and not agreement and then everybody being exposed to that same sense-making item, as Dave Snowden would call it, and then the maths of the um, the interactions across the whole group around that object, and then to use that as a way of measuring the depth of learning that people had around that knowledge object. And the guy's still around occasionally. I catch up with him, but he's a, a tricky, awkward, and very clever guy, <laughs> but didn't survive as a startup as so many don't. But similar idea to what you described. Oh, yes. Okay. Um, go ahead. Sorry, I just saw the reasoning, the the Rick's uh, resume of the Enigma reason. It's that is so far from what the point of the book is. It's not cool. even funny. Cool. <laughs> this is uh, actually they tear into the notion of uh, type one, type two reasoning. They don't believe in it at all. Uh, they say, yes, we have, we find all these cognitive flaws and starting with um, confirmation bias. 
evolution is generally very good. Uh, how could it produce something so flawed? Well, it's because we're not measuring what evolution tried to optimize. Uh, and what, to simplify the point, when we're measuring individual reasoning, it is not what evolution tried to optimize. Evolution tried to optimize group reasoning. And people are much better at group reasoning than individual reasoning. And actually, if you think from a group reasoning standpoint, confirmation bias is a very sound heuristic. You, If you have five options to examine, having each person look at the pros and cons of five options is a waste of time. Have each person look at the pros of their one option, then to get, like divide the work and then come together, decide, uh, uh, share about the pros of each option and then come with the either choice or synthesis, a new synthesis or whatever. But specialization is actually a good time-saving heuristic. And in that context, focusing on a single option and finding the confirmation for your own option is perfectly reasonable. And then when we try to do it individually, um, it's it fails. We get we get caught up in our own. We start believing ourselves, but they go very much into the the, the conditions where we get into self reinforcing versus group cooperation. Now, of course, there are cases where the group thinking doesn't work well at all, and there we know about. Uh, polarization in groups and things like that, but they go into that. But uh, so, yeah, I wouldn't say it's about reasoning could be approved. Uh, yeah, it's, it's it's not just that it's, we can improve our reasoning through others. It's that it's what our brain evolved to do. It's, which I think is a broader point. Yes, Rick. No, I, I really appreciate you tearing AI apart. Uh, I think it's beautiful because in some respects, it, the best it does is to raise the floor. And then you can say, you can tear it apart, disagree with it, and make a much better video, a nugget about why anybody should read the book. So when I was looking at it, I was thinking, well, you know, do I want to read that book? I mean, I've got so many things on my shelf anyway, and I've got to think, what's the most important thing to learn? And, and the nice thing about you know, creating sort of, uh, I mean, I've heard Jose talk about this as well, you know, in the past about reading a whole book, and whatever, do you need to read the whole book? Can you get the essence down to something that would encapsulate the secret source in such a way that it would at least give you a little bit more of a head start, if you want to incorporate that body of knowledge? I see Wendy shaking her head. So please disagree with me. <laughs> um, yeah. Okay. So we had a history in our previous call. First of all, Engelbart and Nelson contrasted, okay, and they didn't see eye to eye and they never had the quality conversations that we all wish they did. They couldn't even have a prize co-named. So just saying that. And also that GLAM conference, um, the, the, the signal and the noise came up as a piece and the minute you tried to reduce the quality of a collection to a particular conclusion, you lost the point. So it was the coming in and the coming out and the biases that were held in the system were only obvious when you did that. So the summary is actually the entry and the exit and the entry and the exit or the staying in and the entry and the exit from other people's ideas. That was where the value was. It wasn't actually in any summary that anyone did um, because they were all talking about massive collections truly massive collections yeah. and there was no way that you could ever see any summary across all of them but there was a signal if you looked at say a, um, digitized photographs um, from a particular era in a p particular coll um, collection kept on coming back to beaches in the Philippines or something like that I mean we're calling it they're calling it oddities now Jax at ANU don't use don't use um, the other word hallucinations oddities oddities but the oddities are the information in some ways. It's it just like <laughs> coming in and going out. So anyway, that why why were they particularly getting a biased signal? And it was because 
the collections were captured in a certain way and only had those things in it. And because some of those images had not been seen for 150 years, you know, since they were first created, no one could actually see that there was a pattern. But if you left that and came back again, you'd see something different. Um, but anyway, the summaries never get it. It's like that is a summary. <laughs> That's the closest I can get to it. And this is a summary. And you can shake this one and you can untangle this one. That, to me, is a summary. It's like being in the bush. Jack's has got a gum tree behind her. But we can only see one side of the gum tree. Anyway, the summaries, the essence is more important than the actual summary. Which is getting me thinking a lot. Thank you for that point, because I'm realizing that all too often the concluding thing or artifact around an event conference, whatnot, even if it was meant to target the creation of a thing, is usually unsatisfying. And the things that were really satisfying were the glimmers of aha along the way that you or others got and the shifts of point of view or the connections between people. Those are all the juicy, interesting things. And they're evanescent. They happen and then they kind of go away and they're not marked by a document or a dot voting yeah. scheme or, or anything else like that. It um, wasn't added to that glam thing. And this I said this in the previous call, I'll say it again. What was interesting was not what was not said. One was you cannot archive everything in the conference. So you cannot. You can't digitally archive and annotate effectively with um, context, context data and metadata, all the things in every library across the whole world ongoing. There just aren't the resources to do it. Well, the Mark and... Anton is trying hard. <laughs> well, they didn't have that conversation. They didn't have the conversation about managed decay, really. Yeah. They were absent conversations and they were much more interesting. It's like, okay, what happens if we can't keep all of these things? Now what do we do? What's what's the summary now? I also wanted to put one other thing in the conversation back to the topic of alternate interpretations of what a book is about. Uh, and Rick, I know that yours was a prompt and as opposed to uh, what Marc Antoine got from the book. But um, I did, a, and this is also in the interest of talking about nuggets and narratives. Uh, so I did a video some years ago called um, uh, and a five minute university about the great transformation. And this is actually eight minutes long, but I have a trope called five minute universities where if, if there's something you really know a lot about and are passionate about, why don't you explain it to everybody as simply as you can within five minutes. And then at retreats, we would do five minutes of Q and A and then bounce to the next person who had volunteered to do a five minute university. And the idea was that within an hour, you could quickly go through six of these or five of them. Uh, and everybody would know who they wanted to corner over lunch or talk to later. I mean, it, it, you weren't trying to answer all the questions along the way, but you were trying to get really interesting things in the room. And from the great from Polanyi's book, The Great Transformation, the thing most people write about or talk about is the double movement. Uh, but I got a whole mess of other things out of the book that I explained in that video. Uh, and for me, that's a sort of a collection of nuggets that I strung together into a narrative uh, that is in a, as short a video as I could make about that thing, um, all by means of, or, or in order to maybe, and this is a huge maybe, reduce the burden of our want to read lists, because I think we all have stacks and stacks and stacks of things, because we're all in lots of conversations where people say, oh my God, you have to read this thing, or you have to watch this two-hour Schmachtenberger interview. I'm like, I only have so many two-hour blocks in my life, even at one and a half or one and three quarters speed. Like I, you know, can't make it, can't make my way through all these sorts of things. Um, but I, but I'm extremely interested, uh, maybe to the point of obsession, in us comparing notes about things and seeing where we disagree, and then playing that out and absorbing the other person's point of view as much as possible. Uh, you know, seeing, seeing how all this works, seeing how all these things play together. I think, I think that's crucial for us to do. And last note. I think because we don't have any kind of persistent memory or a persistent place where we're having these conversations, we wind up having more superficial conversations more often. We're just scalloping along the surface all the time instead of actually solving these problems better. So let's go Rick, then Mark Antoine. Yeah, just just to dovetail on that, um, I have to give credit for David Witzel for bringing this to my attention through GRC. Uh, he mentioned uh, a movie about social capital, which is called join or die and mm -hmm. uh it's it's a fascinating book and in some respects what it's um what you just described is that we're, we're now enabling 
the technology to actually interfere with our abilities to make connections so that we can become more superficial and less connected. And that the whole premise of this documentary, which is his life's work, it, it's, it's, you know, uh, Bowling Alone was his, you know, famous book, but uh, this documentary, it, it, it's, you know, he's now in his 80s and he's now, you know, looking back on his life. And, and it's absolutely a, a, a amazing. Uh, and he said one of the biggest drops of connection was the onset of TV and, of course, screens. So TVs and screens actually have, you can't say it's a causal relationship, but you can see the trend over 50 years about how people are becoming less interpersonally connected. And uh, it's well worth watching. So a documentary well worth watching. Thank you so much. I haven't heard about it. Uh, and then either Mark Antoine or Jax. I, I don't know exactly who came in first. Mark Antoine, you go first. Thank you. Yeah, the, I <laughs> I tried to raise the hand with signal and didn't work. Um, the for me, that's the reason I want to have knowledge objects which are edging towards formal um, formal descriptions as opposed to just text, because it's easier to do a diff on uh, formal descriptions than on text. And as you said, Jerry, look at where are they different? Where are the disagreements? Where are the uh, differences? Trying to be formal, it's more, it's easier to compare. That's all I have to say about this. Tax. Please, Tax. Um, I just love these conversations. Um, and I think I'm, Bouncing back around a few things, maybe that Rick said and Jerry said, um, that challenge that we have to get across as many of the books that come our way, and you know, and it's part of that speed kind of society that we're part of. And then we've, um, I value these conversations, these type of conversations, because there's a bit of time we can bounce ideas around. Which Jerry's, I think, what you're talking about, like we can go backwards and forwards and do that in our. In a, in a conversation and we've got our neo books where you know technically you do that within the book so there's a conversation happening over time there and I, I think I want to sort of um, where I come from um, Jose I think I've been thinking about my belief system and, and uh, from something you said a few weeks ago about no you know you know know thine self <laughs> um, and because the way I take in information is often in these forums and I'm a very slow book reader. I love books. I love the language. I can immerse myself in them and I've certainly read a lot and I've written, written a lot there. But when it comes to digesting or accessing knowledge and, and in quick, succinct kind of grabs, often this is the best forum because now I know that I want to go and have a look at the uh, ending of reason and I want to have a look at this and I now have learned a new term and all that. Like this is actually very good learning uh, about the world and each of these meetings um you know thank you to jerry are like that in different ways in different forums it means that i might not have the depth that all of those books would give because i haven't got that time to read 10 books in a day even on double speed no one does and then you have to go well my belief system or the one i'm trying to cultivate is one around um being around slow time and then being discerning and then finding where I do want to go deep and dive deep. Like there's a mechanism that is around this, which is not about, you know, gobbling up every little piece of deep information in the world, but actually kind of having going through there with purpose. And I'm, I'm trying to think, Wendy, with that, you, um, your great example about the, the, you know, digitizing everything in the whole wide world and it's an impossible project. It just brings up these other ideas about what what we value, what we privilege, what the powers are there, then what our role is to sort of identify, you know, things that we think should be maintained or should be passed along. So it's all those sorts of things. But you can't do that in a frenetic space. And our world, our society at the moment, and my deep belief is that we are in strife because of this, is so wound, um, tightly wound around the um, the productivity and the work ethic um, thing that people don't have, yeah, they haven't got that ability to actually access any of this on a deeper level. Um, yeah, so more, more a comment and um, and trying to sort of see how this fits within us going slow and, yeah, 
So pressing everyone so hard they don't have time to see or listen or absorb new material or anything yeah. like or process what's happened or whatever. Yeah. Totally agree. Yeah. Uh, Jose? So um just so much. It's like you know, 40 minutes is a is a is a book. Uh listening. We like to, to set a banquet table. <laughs> <laughs> listening to you guys um but i i keep coming back to this feeling that what we're pointing at at least what it feels like i'm pointing at is that our communications today are are digital for the most part um when we communicate digitally if we had the affordance of nuggets that we could embed in our digital communications, then be it social media or email or uh, texting, then we could reference things that uh, are pre-existing that we can then embellish on, that we can enhance, that we can add to. And then we could have a global conversation because we're building on each other's thoughts and ideas. It is amazing to me how often I'll pick up a book and I'll read that book and I'll go, holy shit, I've had seven of those ideas before. Mm -hmm. Never knew somebody else had them a hundred years ago. Right. To me, it felt like they were novel. Right. Mm -hmm. Because there was no way for me to easily find those ideas until I read that book. Mm. And, and I'm kind of lost in this space thinking, does anybody agree with that idea? Does that idea really resonate? Does it, does it link to anything? Mm. Right. And so it's this feeling like we want the likes because we feel disconnected. But if we could not have the likes and have the resonance of speaking with the multitudes of voices that are thinking the way we think, have the same thoughts, the same ideas, the same uh, resonant, uh, resonance around ideas, then maybe that would be much more powerful for us when we communicate with each other. Because I'm not speaking with my voice alone. I'm speaking with our voice. Mm. And, and to me, that that's what neobooks could empower, is, is a new paradigm by which we are communicating with each other on this new plateau. that's what i'm hearing us talk about but i don't know i love that that's that's where i'm aiming anyway for sure thank mm. you um mark antoine uh, i think a lot of us are aiming there the um, the question of the known unknowns right there's the things that you've thought but you've thought in your own terms and you cannot search for it because you don't know what terms whoever else has used who came before. And then there's the things you sh would need to know and not know about. So you cannot have, uh, you don't know what to search for. A and being able to have a, a, a map view of here's the neighborhood of this idea. Like, let me describe it. And can we, and, and yeah. up to a point LLMs can, with embeddings, try to find vaguely neighboring things. But again, it will do so much better if the idea is fractal and semi-formal so that it can say, oh, this part is, this part I know what it is, this part I know what it is. So this configuration I can look for again, this configuration of putting this and this together is something I can look for again. And, and, and here's another way that these pieces have been assembled. These are all things that can be done when the structure is made explicit. 
Love that. Over. Love that. Wendy, please. Um, the contribution here is one around dopamine and ego. <laughs> um, part of the part of the problem, I think, with this individualist bit is because we're not listening to someone else. Um, often, even to ourselves, when somebody when we hear a resonance, we get stuck in this little echo chamber, where because we're getting the dopamine for the first time, then. It's like, oh, I need to stay in my own little place because I can get more dopamine. Getting the dopamine from the the connection with somebody else about their idea is a harder sell because, and so what happens is like nobody's ever had, I'm, and now I'm hearing in what you said something that I have believed and written about. I mean, I'm I'm, I'm excited about this. It's like I, I have to go and get the jar. So you, I was absent from the conversation. I literally was, and then I had to settle myself around this still existing and being easy to find, which it was when I calm myself. It's like, okay, here's a metaphor, and it's something I created years ago, long time before I knew any of you guys, okay? Here's another one that my dad created. So these are short hands for me to get something complex out that fits in a system, but I've got to hold them. I'm back in my own story about why I created this and why my dad created that. There's a story behind both of them and I'm in my own story because I'm getting something from that because it's not listened to. I mean, these are stories I only share with you guys, but I'm very quick in a conversation to bring this out and then I have to tell the story of why it's there. So my point is that I think that this individual bit and then sharing the knowledge, it takes a bit of time to tell the story and I sort of, I really like what you're talking about, you know, Rick and Jose, you know, there's, there's something here about some of the physiology is holding us back. Some of our ancient physiology, we're getting the dopamine from the wrong thing and we have to go off and do bright, shiny object. And then that takes up time. I've taken up too much time in this call. The graphics thing is to do, I'll make a quick statement here. The graphics thing is um, shorthand, graphic artist, really clever, travelled the world, came back, lives in my world, she said that we're moving from logos to GIFs in the graphics world. Logos Just let me GIFs, know. GIFs, not GIFTs. Yeah, GIFs. So oh. if something that moves is noticeable. You mean a, a moving logos? Yeah, mo moving logos, logos in motion. Okay. Yeah, because she's getting hired for that by companies. Very interesting. There's um, a word, uh, Liesels, Lizzes. There's a word for little animated graphics. I'll, I will find it, but it's it's like GIFs. Uh, animated GIFs, except it's uh, it's actually a more functional way of doing animation on stuff. I'll 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 find the word. What was you saying? Um, I, I think there's we we talked Antoine uh, Mark Antoine, pardon me, um, mentioned um, the we share a middle name. Uh, I'm uh, Antonio, so ah. for some reason I always think of you as Antoine. Um, the uh, the fact that we have LLMs that cannot currently under our data structures precisely match things, as you mentioned, Mark Antoine, I think that creating a structure that they could learn and having them do most of the of the actual formal work. Um, with with human supervision, I, I hear you. Um, but I think there's an opportunity to do things that we could never do because we wouldn't have the time to do or the ability to do uh, in a formal way that really brings about the capabilities that we're talking about that I'm not going to write um, a tweet if they still exist, are they X's? I don't know. Um, uh, X tweets. <laughs> X tweets. <laughs> uh, if um, if I, I'm not going to write that, I'm not going to spend a whole bunch of time figuring out what formal stuff I need to integrate, whatever. It needs to be really accessible. But if I have an AI companion that actually does that for me, that links it to the NeoBooks Nuggets, as part of the process, 
then now we're talking about bringing this to the table. Um, I don't think it's adding more load to us. I think it's actually reducing the load and yet increasing. So for example, I write something. I think it's a great idea because I'm, you know, I just came up with it. Oh, wow, I'm excited about it. Let me put it on X. And I go and I tweet it. And as I'm doing it, it says, oh, by the way, XYZ already had that idea. Isn't that amazing? Let's link to that right. as part of this whole thing. You might to want to me, cite, cite them as you're posting. And, and not so much cite the individual, though that's obviously a good thing, but cite the nugget, reference the nugget, bring it back to the nugget, because that's where the conversation about that topic exists in the world. Or, or even adopt the nugget or meld with the nugget in some interesting ways. That, I, that could be our new our new motto, meld with the nugget. <laughs> I'm ahead, Mark, Mark, Mark Antoine, actually, Rick then. Yeah, Mark. my hand keeps going down. I don't know what's I going should. on. Dude. It does it automatically. Well, I think. Well, actually, when you make any noise at all, it thinks you've spoken. And if you look down, it'll say, canceling your hand in five, four, three, two. Uh, yeah, three. I missed, I missed and it. If you, and if you don't catch that little thing that's not very easy to see, it will drop your hand for you. Um, so let's go, Rick, then Mark Antoine. Yeah, I just want to come back to this notion of nuggets and maybe thinking about the accretions that evolve that actually make them better over time so that when you can connect and you think you've got a new idea and realize that idea has been worked on for a long time and you thought, well, at least I came up by, by myself with the same idea, which is, you know, uh, you can deserve to give yourself a pat on the back for that. But I want to come back to the issue of a book um, because today I heard uh, John Marks um, speak today on a Zoom call, and he was the uh, the founder for Search for Common Ground. Um, and he's ended his life and he's written a, a new book. And you know, people come to the end of their life and they decide to write a you know their life's work. You know, what can we learn from people's life's work? And he's written a book. I'll put it in actually, Jerry. I've got something to share here. Um, and it was on uh, the title of the book is Vision to Action. And um, he was a fascinating guy. He, he'd spent 20 years in Iran in the negotiation, high diplomatic level, very much schooled in sort of peacemaking negotiations and whatever. But he, in his, in his, he, he was an activist, uh, a prudent stride activist in his youth, apparently. And then he converted into becoming a peace activist. Um, and a negotiator, a diplomatic negotiator. And I asked him this question because he said something which I thought speaks to what Wendy was talking about, the dopamine thing. We all love dopamine. You know, we love being in company with people. Where we feel the love, you know. And, you know, um, and, and it's, it's, you know, it's, it's a great experience. On the other hand, that love can be so strong that it blinds us uh, to so many things that we don't see things we should be seeing, like, you know, uh, the Trump deranged syndrome. Um, and so, you know, but what, the reason why I want to bring this book up is because he, I asked him the question, well, you know, you know, we're living in times where peacemaking isn't making the headlines. Uh, you know, we're, we're you know, and, and he was saying, well, then you need to have the activists to do the, the confrontation. And, you know, I, I challenged him. I says, well, can't you be both? And he, he sort of implied you couldn't, which I thought was kind of interesting given his story. I don't know enough about his story, but having listened to his story, I'm ambivalent about buying his book based upon what he said, because I don't think he persuaded me enough in his presentation that I would go and read the book. And I mean, that dilemma happens all the time. You hear somebody speak and think, well, do I want to go down that rabbit hole? Because his life experience, I mean, he's got such a, you know, uh, an amazing life story to tell. But to me, this is the dilemma of choosing what do you learn next? Uh, you know? And do you do it in community or do you do it, you know, as solo, you know, um, uh, voyagers on your heroic journey, which is not going to be very heroic. So anyway. No, no, that's, that's where I was trying to get. Uh, and by the way, I, I'd like to, to find that uh, specific is oh is that the thank mm -hmm. you that's the reference excellent curious uh we on the one hand 
when Jose was speaking about AI, I agree. Some of that AI should help us and handhold us when, while we try to understand more formal knowledge and, and, and formalize our own knowledge. I, I see a huge opportunity for people who are who have ideas and who are shy because they're afraid to be mocked because the idea is half-baked and, and to get them to still manage before it gets uh, published. Uh, and also, my goodness, so much of that is a community function and it's about finding people who are close to you so you don't have to do this alone or with an AI. I mean, how sad that we delegate. And it's about, we need to learn in community. I mean, we used to learn in, um, well, of course, with family, but very much with, you know, uh, community of practice, learn guilds at, in the Middle Ages. Uh, we learned by doing. And, and, and being, I think, the art of honing a thought is, a, yes, we need help to do it better. And, and getting AI involved is useful because we're more likely to be able to scale that in terms of numbers, but also if the AI can guide us to, here are people who have thought that and you can hone that thought with them to create ad hoc communities around, uh, you know, somebody who is beginning to think about something because we need the learning process and the learning spaces. Uh, and, and that is one thing that scares me about AI people delegating the the hard thinking to and the, the and the friction uh, we need the friction to improve our thoughts and AIs are we had that thought last week right AI can be too agreeable but also we need the the protocol of how do we diffuse the friction the friction and make it productive and that's a social learning process we don't want to lose that mm. so over love that I think we. I wish we did more social learning or emphasized it more or recognized it more because it feels to me like most social, most learning is social and it feels to me like we've individuated learning partly because of we're in the cult of the individual, but partly also because there's so many people. How are we ever going to test them all or know that they all know what they know, which is a terrible and stupid reason to, to undermine social learning. Uh, Jax, you were, uh, your hand dropped accidentally, I think. Oh, yeah, it probably did. Um, maybe we need to invent a concept called trust, Jerry. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Someone should work yeah, on yeah. that. Um, <clears throat> uh, on that on that social learning, I'm just remembering in the in sort of a learning, um, some science around the learning, like which you think we're doing here, is that you learn the concept the first time, and then you've got to re revisit it within 24 hours, and then you've got to revisit it within a week for it to actually take take. Um, uh, sort of to go into your longer term memory and to actually be learned. So um, I can't remember where that's from, some sort of um, teaching pedagogy, but um, I think when we have a weekly conversation, then there's an opportunity to learn some of it because you're going, oh, that's right, last week we talked about this, and then that gets put back into your memory. And that's a social interaction. And the if you come across a book, you can read it and you can interpret some of it. But if it's a really good book or you're interested in that or you're researching it, you'll go back to that book or that quote or that piece of information a few more times and learn it that way. So this is really valid, I think, to be looking at the the, the digitization of everything as a learning um, thing when it's actually a social interaction. So I, I think I'm really just agreeing there with you, Marc-Antoine. Um, the digital... Um, so let me gather this for a moment. Um, I've been thinking a lot about batons and passing the baton as a physical um, gesture of something that's being passed along. And Wendy, I'm thinking about your jars there and that contextual space of holding onto a jar that has meaning for you. It's connected to you and your meaning and then you're able to talk about it and, and bring it into other people's. And then other people might have a jar that's similar or they or they got or they can look at it from another side and then they take that information, which is I think that mycelium kind of transferal. They don't get to keep the jar. They just get to keep whatever's passed along. And when I've been thinking about a metaphorical um, baton, 
it's kind of not actually, it's passed along in a physical sense, but in the digital sense, we don't pass the baton on, we pass something else gets passed along, which is that sense of knowledge or learning or wisdom or nuggets or whatever it is. And that that's like a transfer that's happening through here. And um, yeah, maybe like, I think it's more what I think, what I think we're trying to do in some ways is trying to find like an organic way of that knowledge transfer going through in a digital forum. And um, Mark Antoine, I, I share a lot of your concerns around LLMs and and um, writing, by the way, and I appreciate your the what you bring into this space because of that. And I've been exploring it because I'm curious about it and I want to understand how it's impacting or what what difference it makes to the way that we write and think. Um, so sometimes it can look like I'm very pro um, AI, and it's mostly because I'm still trying to you know find out what my thinking is around it. Um, why I say that is in relation to a put a comment up when when we were talking about the um, Jose, we were talking about that sort of sense of oops, didn't put on silent for him about. You know, if you're someone, and we've all done this, we've all lost, we've all wandered around lost until we found a little bit of an idea here and then we've connected to it and then we've wandered around a bit lost and then we found a person who's connected with another idea and then that person's opened up a whole area for us and we've gone, oh, if I hadn't met Jose, I would never have known about our um, protocols, you know, and here's this whole world that's opened up to me. So that's a relational kind of exploration. I've been... Um, probably for a long time trying to wrestle with how I um, capture, I'm using that word deliberately, capture the pieces of knowledge and nuggets that I come across and where I'm putting them and how I store them, which is how I've ended up, um, Jerry, coming across you and your work because I was like, ah, oh, the brain, fantastic. That might, that's the answer to all my problems. And um, But really what it is is I want Jerry's brain, I want my brain to look like Jerry's brain, but have have the bits that I'm interested in in this other area. And I know that there's one of the one of the short falls of it is you can't do that kind of um, worldwide collaboration of those things because we've all got slightly different filing systems. Now, um, not uh, that's where I'm doing. I'm doing some leapfrogging of ideas here. So then, then I was like, well, probably what I'm trying to do is to enter into a world where I can then go and find my way through ideas and then gravitate to one and then explore that a little bit further. When I was thinking about that, I went, okay, that's a 3D or a 4D world. That's a digital world. And then I went, isn't that the world? Isn't that our real world? Yeah. Isn't that actually life, what we're doing in the physical space? Mark Antoine's not sure. Jerry's not sure about that. I've got a few downs there. But it's like, there is a world out there that is ready to be explored. And, uh, you know, so it's like sometimes we're kind of duplicating it or we're finding an extra way of it. Now, my final finishing point on here because um, is that when you don't, and I, I grew up in a rural environment and my parents were book, they, they bought books um, as a way of investing in their children. So they subscribed to book clubs and all those sorts of things. They're reasonably educated people for sort of country people. And I like to think my father was like when I was a child, Gregory Peck in To Kill a Mockingbird. And I suspect he ended up being more like the adult version um, that Harper Lee did later on that was more critical of that character. Um, but that that meant that as a rural experience, I'm sure others here have had this too, you kind of get locked out of a whole heap of ideas and then all of a sudden you come across them in a bunch and then you go and you go to a bigger town or a bigger library or a bigger group of people and all of a sudden you get unlocked to another bunch of ideas. And that's um, spatial computing. Yeah, so that, I'm trying to, in my, in my dialogue, put together, or my monologue, put together what that that is and it's just starting to form in my mind um, of some sort of um, thing and I wonder if that's sort of part of the process of being part of these conversations and while we imagine and then try and put together our um, neo book world and our nuggets and what it is we're actually trying to create and then send along uh, and I'd I'd quite like to walk in that world but then again I think I already am walking in that world is what I wanted to add. Thank wow. you. That's me over. Wow. Thank you. That's a, that's a that's a lot of great stuff. 
uh, there's this future conversation they have about 3D, 4D, whatever D, uh, and I and, and I think Mark Antoine and I have different but complementary points of view on those topics that might help sort of inform this. I don't I, I don't think this is a piece of what you're researching, but it, but it sounds like it's a piece of your vision of of a, of a of an optimal future. And then Apple just recently released you know spatial computing around their goggles. Uh, there have been several other visions that are tied to geography or geo coordinate systems or things like that, none of which sound good to me. Um, mm. And there's a bunch of reasons for a conversation when we have more time. Um, uh, and, and we can kind of go into it in a, in a, in a different period. But um, we're, we were aiming to, to make these calls more like an hour, although we're, well, we're nicely over the hour and things are just getting juicy. So I'm happy to hang out for longer. And I, I don't have a call right after the, you know, our, our regularly scheduled Neobooks call right now. So this is good. Uh, so let me go to Rick. Yeah, I'd like to return to a comment that um, Jose mentioned right at the very beginning, which was you know, reconnecting to something that happened a week ago and uh, a suggestion. I, I, I don't know whether you, you put these up on YouTube, the discussions we're having now or not. Uh, yes, or not all these calls go up on YouTube. Okay, that's fine. That's great. Because um, what I would suggest is uh, we can do it now if people feel like it or spend a little time thinking about what is the thread that you're taking with that you might want to continue on the next week. Um, and that doesn't mean to say we're wedded to any of the threads that people come up with, but at least it, 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 it creates a platform for thinking about What's going to happen in the next next week's conversation? Sorry, uh, Jerry, you're going to say something. No, uh, don't be sorry. I was interrupting you a little bit. Um, I've tried a bunch on many of the OGM calls to say, hey, let's use the Mattermost channel between calls to yeah. discuss yeah. what we're going to talk about next week, yeah. et cetera, et cetera. Except few people actually refer there and go there and use it. And fewer people pose an interesting question that we then start to discuss. I really yeah. like the Mattermost channel as that vehicle, as a, as a place because sometimes it's too much traffic or too specific for the OGM list. And I don't want to flood everybody with, you know, everything we all see. Um, but I, I mean, love, I, I was thinking more of that. I was, yeah, I, I was thinking just on YouTube because it does mean that if people come and they read something and they're curious and you make a point at four minutes, somebody said something, Oh, I want to see what that person had to say something. So it becomes public rather than behind, you know, um, you know, a private group. Um, Anyway, I just want to throw that idea out there. I'm going to do that on that last one anyway. And if people feel like it's worth, but it doesn't have to be much. It can just be a few words, just something to anchor whatever happened today that piqued your curiosity and say, you know, um, you know, this is what I do in clinical practice. All I have to write down what the future conversations are going to be because I won't remember it unless I put it down on my notes. I'm the same way, same way. Uh, Wendy, uh, you have to unmute though. Um, anyway, I'm going to honor my time with Jack shortly. I'm going to encourage you to do the same because I think it might be um, the the piece. So there's something that Pete said about a summary of a meeting and being there. And so there's the outside observer and then there's the person who was actually in the meeting. Um, and then there's this series. So we had two meetings um, and the many of us were in the same room in the first meeting and the conversation, the thread of the conversation did spread, okay? There was a continuity piece. But that was partly because I had a shorthand for something that was complicated or messy or whatever you want to call it, complex, depending on who you want to be with respect to Dave Snowden and other people. So we had a shorthand way that was recognised socially in two end-to-end -end meetings with me waving something around, which would be visible to someone else seeing it. And they could say, oh, that's that thing. Now there's, if you backtrack, then that was something that would be visible to someone else because it appeared twice and it was a, a tactile thing that I could hold and you could imagine holding. So there's something here about the sensory experience of actually being in the meeting that means that you appraise it differently. And what Pete said was when he saw a summary of a meeting that he knew a bit about the content, the feed-in, but he wasn't there at the second meeting. He couldn't pick up the thread of the next meeting. There was something missing. So I actually have, since literally have, tangerine and vanilla, okay? So if everyone smelt tangerine and vanilla, our ideas 
could be coded to this particular meeting more strongly than my little metaphor. Mm -hmm. If we were all fiddling with string at the same time, there's something about anchoring the senses in that moment that make it a reasonable and strong idea. And I've I've done this. Um, I know it's done. Um, there's a an elder in Canada who does it, M Melanie Goodchild, and she talks oh, about yeah. tea. Okay, she talks about tea, and she says that if she and her Japanese or Chinese cohorts drink the tea together, they start thinking along the same way. So there's something about not even worrying. This is an artifact, but even getting more base than that to say, do we all agree on X, sort of, and using that as a starting point to evoke the next point. And I don't think we can do it with words properly. Poetry is another one. This is Marc Antoine. I should bring this. So I'll leave this with you. Maybe I'll get better value. This is sensibility and French poetry in the 20th century. It's got very, very rich ideas, but I don't know French well enough to make the most of it. That's the sort of level... And it's like, oh, very shaky. But we need to quickly get to some ideas that we can use as the next. And the shorthand for that, um, poetry is a little bit too messy maybe. Um, descent might be good enough. Just metaphors that we could live with. Um, and I don't want many of them. <laughs> Otherwise, it's going to get very messy when all of these get together. Mm -hmm. Exactly. <laughs> And that's part of the problem is like, you know, just agreeing it's going to be the argument about which three cents or which two T's or what type of string or whatever it is. And we have to agree to disagree on that one and then move on or otherwise, yeah. Sensory so, stuff. Jose, you had had three intense calls before this one, so I don't envy your, <laughs> the state of your neurons right now. Um it's been a great conversation. I'm thinking we should wind it up so that, and you have your own your own scent right there. I think April has a couple of scents right here as well. Yeah. So we, should, we should let Jax and Wendy meet IRL. IRL, how bizarre. IRL, that old fashioned grand way. In the second time in a, in in seven days, I believe, Wendy. Well, yeah, God. almost the same day the first time. Yeah, how's that? A lot, a lot of happening, and uh, yeah, I think we need to do more IRL in parallel with this because I think we might be able to do some weaving behind the scenes. And I've connected with Jose on LinkedIn, but not Rick, and I don't know enough about either of you, and I have no right to know anything really. <laughs> Their lives are open books. Uh, all you have to do is go Neo look at my books. brain and you'll see everything they've everything mm. they've ever done. Mm. Um. So with that, let's uh, let's wrap this call. I, I really appreciate this conversation. It's been fabulous. Uh, so until soon. Thanks. Thanks, everybody. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye. Bye.